Hey, good morning. Welcome. 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 Uh, I've started the recording wave. Uh, we'll get started and uh, we'll let people join in as they come. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you. Lord, we thank you that your mercy is in you every morning. And we thank you for your faithfulness that sustains us, that uh, sees us beyond our sins. You don't keep a record of our sins, Father. Uh, I thank you, Lord. I pray that we would live a life that is worthy of our calling. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Okay. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Dave, I hope I'm audible. Uh, you can hear me. Something's wrong. Uh, Dave, just give me a second. Something's wrong with the uh, thing. Um... Yes, sir. We can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm unable to share my screen. Um, it's giving me an error uh, for some reason. I don't know what the error, uh, what the issue is. But if you don't mind, I'm going to continue without sharing my screen, and I'm going to request you to follow along uh, in your PDF where we stopped last uh, yesterday, in page thirty-one of your PDF, uh, page thirty-one of chapter six. Okay. Yeah, okay. Chapter six. So. Um, yeah, we uh, ended with this last note. Um, we went, we kind of uh, looked at the culture that is being set and the trend, some of the trends that are being followed by our young people and the importance of them. And uh, on the last note, we saw that by 2030, uh, millennials, that's uh, Generation Y and Generation Z, uh, will represent 75% of the global workforce. Uh, the question we ended with was, will they represent 75% uh, of your church? That's some. That's a food for thought right there. And uh, and so now moving into the second section uh, is now that, now that we have some sort of an insight and understanding of uh, the culture that is being set by the youth and uh, and for them. Uh, how can we tailor a youth ministry that has maximum impact? Right, so Ecclesiastes 1.4 says, one generation passes away and another generation comes, uh, but the uh, earth abides forever. And one generation passes away and another generation comes. So before this generation passes away, uh, can we do something that we can, uh, and how we can impact their lives, right? So that's the premise. Um, so impacting millennials, impacting generation uh, Y and Z, uh, how do we do that, right? We are remember, we are talking about tailoring a youth ministry that has maximum impact, okay? So the use of technology and social media is one thing, okay? So when, you run, when we run a survey, uh, which was done between generation Y and Z, Z in particular, one of the things that they mention um, that defined or shaped their generation is technology. It's something that they can't live without. It's, you know, they need to have it. And if, and if you take away their mobile phones or, or their, the internet, you know, the net in itself, uh, they feel like they are uh, paralyzed. It's like, you know, they don't know what to do, you know? And um, so that's the situation. That's the, uh, you know, connect. Uh, it's uh, that the, this generation has with the technology, right? So it's not just the number of devices or how uh, frequently they interact uh, with digital technologies. Right? The, uh, one of the studies say that, um, and on an average, a young person uh, checks their phone every six minutes. Okay, on an average, uh, every, every they check everyone, uh, a young a young person checks their phone every six minutes uh, and if you know it's like become a habit right um, and um, there was another study done uh, when it comes to habits with uh, those who smoke right uh, cigarettes or, or whatever who generally smoke so uh, 
it's more than what they inhale. The, the the thing that is hard to stop for them is the habit of, you know, just more bringing their uh, hands to their mouth. Uh, you know, it's it's that motion, that kind of uh, it's it's that habit that is very that's more hard to break than the actual smoking it in itself. That was a study that was done. Um, and so it's almost similar, isn't it, when you think about uh, that report that says, okay, a young person has to check or look at their phone every six minutes. It's the it's become that habit. It's like, okay, you know? <laughs> uh, and so that's how um, connected this generation uh, is with technology. That's just one example of it, right? So uh, they are so connected yet disconnected. Their heads are, heads are always buried to their phones or their iPads kids uh, playing games on iPads and whatnot. So they understand this generation and the younger generation understands technology far more than the generation that was before, or say, for example, Generation Y um, or, or uh, the generation prior, right? because they did not have such exposure. But the exposure is, uh, of technology is, is great in this day and age. Um, right. So moving on to page 32 in your PDF, uh, for those who just joined, I apologize. I'm unable to share my screen, uh, but uh, let me see if I can do that now. Because it was giving me some sort of an error, and it's still giving me an error. I'm not able to share. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what the problem is. Okay. Um, where was I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's this quote uh, from Benjamin uh, Windle. He says, uh, "Who you are online." is perceived as who you are offline, right? Who you are online is perceived as who you are offline. What does that mean? People, uh, you know, what you show yourself as uh, on the social media platform is what people think you are, right? If, you, uh, if you're going to show yourself as always happy and always happening and cool and whatnot, and people are going to think, okay, that is who you are, even offline. Uh, like that you are always cool always happy you don't have any sad days bad days you know your your life is flying high like a league in the sky you know um so that's the that's the message of that quote there who you are online is perceived as who you are offline the two are synonymous similar same and they are not separate so your online life is perceived as same as your offline life but i remember the days uh where um Gosh, it sounds like so long ago, but uh, just a, 10 years ago, so, you know, oh, social media was defined by Facebook initially. But prior to that, there was another medium called Orkut. It was just a way of engaging, connecting, uh, isn't it? And then it became this marketing playground uh, and whatnot, right? So, but the fact is, technology is the new Sunday. Right, technology is the new Sunday, um, and why we say that? Because like, at the time when I was preparing this document, uh, we were going through the pandemic. Pandemic had just hit uh, COVID nineteen uh, in April of two thousand twenty, and if not all the churches, most of the churches, most of the churches, that's when they realized, like, okay, oops, no, what do we do? Uh, you know, every all these churches that did not know anything about Zoom uh, found out about Zoom, and uh, and so many other uh, churches who did not know about live streaming uh, found it a necessity to start live streaming to be connected with their congregation, right? Uh, and so, and for how, what oh, two years now? Uh, technology has been the new Sunday. It's just an idiom, it, 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 but. You get what I'm saying. Technology only moves forward. It's here to stay. Embrace new technology. It's very important that, uh, that we begin to understand the importance of tech, the power of tech. Um, and it's important that uh, churches have tech-savvy people who understands technology, connectivity, uh, you know, and, and whatnot. Um, so it, it offers amazing opportunities, communicate with people in new ways, such as where 
phone, email, SMS, create community in new ways, uh, disciple and pastor people in new ways to reach people where they are, uh, creative, new, uh, create new uh, educational pathways online to help people grow in biblical knowledge. So, um, I mean, the 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 growth has been incredible in the last two years of of number of pastors and uh, and ministries uh, that have started uh, their own uh, Facebook page or Instagram pages and uh, and you know started reaching out to people because uh, they've realized that's where people are. So it's not just a means of communication, right? It's but they've soon realized that's where people are, right? So most often in the Bible, in the gospel, you'll see gospels, you'll see that Jesus went to where people were, right? Uh, and we at this in our day and age, we must realize um, that people are online that's where they are and that's where we need to go and get uh, and reach out to them okay so the first point there is impacting mill millennials uh, through technology uh, find out come up with different strategies uh, ideas and whatnot and how you can reach out to the, the the youth online okay and the second is relational leadership Guys, by the way, what we are discussing is how do we tailor a youth ministry that will impact the young people, okay? After studying yesterday and the previous session about uh, their cultural backgrounds and the way they think, et cetera, et cetera, and how there are five different generations in our society that's wanting to be heard. So now that we've un understood everything that goes into that, uh, you know, everything that our young people are going through, now what does the church do okay so everything that we're learning today is a response to what we learned yesterday okay so relational leadership i cannot stress enough on this point guys okay relational leadership okay we are in page 32 of the pdf uh, for this generation of young people leadership is not about power Okay, look at those words there for this generation of young people. That means the generations before that, for them, leadership was about power. It was about authority. But this generation doesn't connect the same way. Remember, they change, right? So once again, millennials are fundamentally changing the way they understand leadership. They follow relationship and not authority. Okay, they follow relationship and not authority. Okay, authoritarian leadership style is no longer uh, is no longer ineffective. Some say it is even fatal to a culture. Uh, but so, there's this uh, incredible book by John Maxwell called "The Five Levels of Leadership." Uh, if you have an interest in the topic in the field of leadership. Uh, John Maxwell has a lot of books on the topic of leadership and uh, and I would encourage and, and recommend for you to read some of those. Okay, he has, he's, he's written a lot of materials on the topic of leadership. Okay, um, so one of the books he, he talks about is the five levels of leadership. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at. So uh, he what John Maxwell says is position authority to the lowest level of leadership. Sometimes in our theology of being the senior pastor, leader, or elder, our style gets stuck in this mode. We get confused or, or misunderstand uh, the difference between relational leadership and authoritarian leadership. Uh, but uh, if you come down to page 33, you'll see uh, an image. Okay, uh, this that that is kind of important um, for us to follow. I hope uh, can can you are, are you all there in your page uh, page thirty three is give me a thumbs up I'm oh, sorry uh, yes if you can see that image in page thirty three in your notes okay oh all right okay all right thanks Dave. Okay, so uh, you see that there are five levels of leadership. So we'll start at the very bottom. Okay, this is five levels of relational leadership. 
um, your first thing is about position. Okay, it talks about rights. Uh, people follow you because they have to. Okay, uh, this is the authoritarian uh, leadership, the position based leadership. Uh, is okay, you're a boss, and people will tell, will do what you tell them to do because they not necessarily like you. But because you are in the place of authority in that position, they will follow you because they have to. There's no other go. There's no other option. That's the first level. And we go to the next level. Then you see there is a permission-based uh, leadership, which is based a little bit on relationships. People follow you because they want to. Okay, you see the dynamic is shifting now. Okay, they people follow you because they want to follow you. The difference between the first and the second is drastic. And then it keeps increasing. Um, the production. That is talking about results now. You know, people follow because of what you have done for the organization. Okay, people follow what you have done for the organization. Okay, can you think of an, a person that's done something incredible for an organization or a company? Anyone that you can think of, name of? Any any leader? Uh, what about uh, Steve Jobs? We, we, we all know Steve Jobs, the, uh, the founder uh, of Apple, Apple company. Yeah. So, um, and he's so famous worldwide, isn't it? Uh, and a lot of them in his organization would follow, would want to follow him. They, uh, uh, because one, they are inspired by seeing what he has done for the organization, right? So for how he, how far he's grown at the, the his brand, you know, the company is Apple. And because of what he has done, people will want to follow, right? So that is uh, the production uh, based leadership. Okay, and then you go on to the next level. The fourth level is the people development. Now, the third step is we see that what the person has done for the organization. But in the fourth level, we see they will follow you because of what you have done for them. It's gotten very personal now, isn't it? So if you look at the level one, they follow you because they have to. They don't have a choice. Even even if they don't like you, they will do it. Uh, it's not great. Work will get done. Yeah, but then there's no joy or there's no, like, you know, uh, that inspiration or motivation to follow you. It's like, oh, man, I, will, I want to follow Dave because he's amazing. It's like, you know, I follow Dave because, yeah, you know, he's my boss types, you know. Uh, from there, all the way to level four now, people will follow you because of what you have done for them. Right? So in our context as church leaders or youth leaders, uh, what so the, the one example that I can think of is that shows, that reflects this point, what we have done for them is I'm reminded of uh, the parable of the shepherd, right? the lost sheep how the shepherd goes, leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And that one will always remember what you have done for that, for them. Right? Um, and so that builds relationship. Okay, we are getting into the zone, this bubble of relational leadership. Is are you willing to go after the one? Okay, so that builds the relation leadership and doesn't end there. And the last, the final, the pinnacle is the respect level in your leadership. People follow because of who you are and what you represent. Okay, now it's gone from, it's, it changes everything, isn't it, in this level? It's the pinnacle. It's no longer about what you do for the organization. It's no longer about what you do even for the individual. It's now, it all comes down to it says, you know, it's the level of respect because people will follow because of who you are and what you represent. What are the two things that defines who we are and what we represent? One in the cat, you know, in the character, in our character. 
uh, this is a beautiful old saying, right? That says, uh, your anointing will take you up, but it is your character that will keep you up there. Right? Uh, you know, and God will elevate or promote you. And, but if your character is, is bad, you, you're going to have to fall, isn't it? And that's, I'm reminded of King Saul. Where God anoints him, he chooses him, he elevates him, promotes him to, for, to a level from, from a tribe of, of, of nobody uh, to, uh, to a king of a nation. But then what was his downfall? His character, right? And what he believed and what he stood for. And then your values, um, you know, everything that goes into what you believe in, what you represent, you know, do you represent integrity? Do you represent purity? Do you represent honesty? Do you represent faithfulness? Do you represent generosity? Do you represent mercy? Do you represent forgiving? All of that. And people will see, it's like, okay, you know, his character is amazing. Okay, you need not necessarily be the best orator, the best person who knows English very well, or being able to speak very well, or you might not even uh, preach very good sermons, etc., etc. You might not be a very good teacher or whatnot, but people will see your character is true and your values. They, they you know, they will follow you because you are a man and a woman of integrity, uh, right? So that's the five levels of uh, leadership. And all it connects to is relational leadership, and which is so crucial in our journey as, as youth leaders. Are right, you guys with me? OK, I hope you are. Uh, one of the book recommendations that I would have, uh, I would do at the moment, is this book called Turn the Ship Around. Uh, Turn the Ship Around by uh, L. David Marquet. Okay, L. David Marquet. Um, he was, uh, he's a retired captain from the U S Navy. Um, he talks about relational leadership in a very different view in his book called turn the ship around. Uh, when he took, uh, when he took over, uh, that ship, that particular ship in, of, in the Navy as the captain, that ship amongst the fleet of ships was known as the worst ship, uh, that had the team the crew, everything they, had a very very bad it had the lowest reputation among the fleet uh, in the fleet of navy and it is and this and the book is all about how this captain he turns the ship around as in it's a figure of speech saying how he changed the culture and how he impacted motivated and inspired everyone uh you know in that ship from being the worst to being the best in the navy and we're talking about U.S. Navy, right? It's pretty big. Um, so that, that book is amazing. If you want to learn again, grow more in this thing of leadership, I would uh, you know, encourage you to do that. So he, there's a quote from the book. He says, leadership should mean giving control rather than taking control and creating leaders rather than forging followers. So powerful words there, isn't it? Leadership should mean giving control. It goes against everything that we know of leadership, right? Authoritarian leadership and positional leadership is not, it's all about I am in control. I am in control. It's me. You know, I tell you what to do, isn't it? Uh, I need to have control over my team, my, the people that I'm leading. But here he's saying leadership should mean giving control. Like you give control to the people. You, you let them make decisions. Right, um, you, you let them uh, make the hard decisions or whatever it is that builds the team, their character. And then rather than taking control and creating leaders rather than forging followers. Okay, um, so it's an incredible book, guys. I, I can't recommend that book enough for you to read. So when you can, um, and if you... I'm not sure if I have it. I should have it. Uh, if you want to let me know, I'll send a PDF of it to you. Okay. Lead from authority, but not uh, with not but not with authority. Okay. So the next point is lead from authority, but not with authority. The saying people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care is truer today than it ever has been before. So leading millennials is more about being the guide on the side not a sage on a stage. 
okay, leading this generation of youth, of young people, is more about being their guide, or their friend. Uh, you know, you have to be their pastor, but then you 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 be their pastor not from the place of, of authority. Uh, you know, of saying you have to do exactly what. I tell you, if you do this, then you are that, etc. But no, you're their friend. You guide them. You you share with them. You have that conversation with them. You build that rapport, that relationship, right? Um, it's about sitting next to rather than in front of. Okay, uh, and that's what friends do, isn't it? They sit next to you. They put their arms around you and it's like, okay, tell me what's going on in life. Um, that is what this generation is actually expecting. It was not the same with us, uh, with me at least. I don't know about you guys, but it was a very different culture when uh, I was the youth, when I was a youth. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so moving into the next uh, section, page 34. So now that we've understood relational uh, leadership, um, the next thing is how do we design or... Um, plan our programs and and our events right oops sorry okay. sorry guys my uh, my notes went to a different page altogether okay <clears throat> so page 34 uh visiting revisiting that point that we mentioned in the last chapter about how this generation of young people are time poor that means they have a lot going on in their life so if they want to come to your program or your event they need to see value right they need to see value uh, only then will they come. Otherwise, they you know, 24 hours a day is not enough for them. So what do millennials get from attending a youth service that they can't get online is one of the questions that we need to address. Okay, What do millennials get from attending your youth service that they can't get online? Is your youth service or youth meetings, uh, you know, it, is it so normal um, that they can get the same thing what you're giving them even online right um so that's the question we've got to kind of start with we need to regularly review what's working what's not working and what needs changing we need to ha ask these hard questions guys we need to you know review uh, you know for our own sake for the growth of your ministry uh you know you need to get reviews and feedbacks uh, you know asking this question what is working uh, you know, and then you make a list. You have these team meetings and whatnot. Okay, what is working? Okay, you know, this time of worship is working. This time of games is working. Uh, you know, this is not working. You know, the snack time at the beginning is not working. I think we should need we need to have snack time at the end of our event of our program, uh, etc. Small things, details like that. Uh, you know, and what is not working? Uh, what needs changing? Can we do something differently? So, uh, one of the things that we do at uh, uh, at APC, uh, for after every of a, after all our youth meetings, is we have this small review process. Okay, uh, post event review, um, some of the questions that we ask <clears throat> is okay. Um, and you'll you'll uh, look at it in your notes. There's no fancy words, nothing. You come together as a team uh, after the event or a one day after the event. Uh, it, it's very important that you do it immediately when your memory is fresh of everything that happened in the event. Okay, so you ask this question. Okay, good. Uh, what are the questions? What went well? Uh, what were the positives, the the wins? What, what made this a success? Who did great? Uh, you know, what did we do this time that made things better, uh, etc. And then bad. What went wrong? What didn't work? Uh, why were we not on time? Why didn't we start on time? And you address that. Did we forget anything? Uh, was uh, or was our goal? Was our mission? Was it confusing to the audience who came? 
Uh, right. So these are the simple questions that we will address after all our pit, uh, pit stops. That's the combined youth meetings. And this kind of helps us plan better for the next meeting. OK, I hope you are with me. So uh, once again, just to recap, we are talking about everything, uh, how we can tailor effective youth ministry to impact our youths. Okay, uh, so far, uh, are you guys with me? Any questions? Uh, anything that you want to share? Uh, do, do you have your youth uh, weekly, Pastor? Um, so they, the, the way uh, it works at APC, it's a unique situation here because we have five locations in Bangalore, we have the north, south, east, west, and central, right? And um, so, and now that after the pandemic, we are restarting um, in-person meetings. Um, I have to, I, I would like to be in all the locations, like week after week. So because of that, now because of that, you know, one Sunday I have to be at north, and then the next Sunday I have to be at south. Because of which we have uh, this monthly youth, meetings only once a month so now the plan what what we are trying to do is um, have simultaneous youth meetings at different location happen on the same sunday uh, like give responsibilities to the youth leaders of that location to host it uh, you know so that way uh, we don't have to have we can have more than just one uh, once a month meetings i say so that's the that's the weekly youth meetings, and uh, but we like we have this something called pit stop, right? Pit stop is something where a combined youth it's a combined youth meeting where people uh, youths from north, south, east, west, central, they all come together in one place on a Saturday evening. Um, that's that happens once in two months, uh, or depending on the availability, once in three months. So, yeah, that's yeah. the situation. Yeah. So, right after uh, this pandemic and then uh, this lockdown, yeah. uh, I find it very challenging and very hard to to have regular youth uh, because of the, um, I don't know, I think it's very, very challenging now since they have already been used to uh, being online and doing those kind of uh, services. But now calling out to have a physical um service uh what would you suggest what kind of programs or some other uh things out of uh, not uh, not just sticking to just be having a service but what what do you think it is good uh, good to do with the youth yeah Any so suggestion? yeah uh, i think uh, i can only suggest uh, what's so once the pandemic hit, we started our weekly Zoom meetings, our youth meetings. So from the second, from the third week of March 2020, okay, going March 2020, third Friday, from then, uh, every week at Friday at nine o'clock, we, we had our youth meetings, uh, you know, week after week after week after week month after month, for almost two years, uh, we had our online youth meetings. And we didn't know how long it's going to go on, right? But now that, you know, we are exiting the pandemic, um, we've started our in-person meetings. Now, I've just reduced the frequency of online meetings uh, from meeting every Friday at 9 o'clock. We are doing it once a month to reduce the frequency because uh, people are also going back to offices, uh, you know, and and we've started meeting in person. And uh, because of the time crunch, we've reduced the frequency of it, but we've not completely stopped the online meetings. It's very important to have the hybrid kind of a meeting. You have the in-person meetings as well. And also you have the online meetings as well. Okay, so you, you keep both the options open. Um, you know, and when if, if there are those who come online on for your Zoom meetings or online meetings, uh, you could you could en you could encourage them to, uh, you know, to join our in-person meetings as well. But just be patient because people, like you said, uh, I 
two years is is not a joke no um they uh, it, it a lot has happened in two years right uh, people have lost their jobs uh, people have lost their loved ones their family members there's uh, a, a huge it, it's the lives have changed drastically and uh, and it's led to people becoming very um comfortable uh you know with with just attending services online and what so uh if we were actually having this discussion in a pastors meeting as well regarding uh you know bringing back how do we bring back people to church from att- attending in person services uh apcc we've been doing live streaming for 10 years or more than 10 years actually so more than 10 years right uh we've been live streaming on youtube for over a decade but at watching a live streaming every sunday was really not an option it is like okay if i'm traveling if i if i'm not well if i really can't make it to church then i will stay back home and watch the live stream but what what the pandemic has done now is attending watching the live streaming of the service is the same as attending in person services it's changed our thinking that's how people are thinking there's you know there's no difference there's no need for me to go in person spend the money wake up early uh you know all of that while i can watch the same service experience the same thing at the comfort of my place it's changed a lot of things so i think uh, we need to continue to uh, encourage our people and be patient uh, and not to be too uh, forceful pushy yes uh, you know and that's where they need like we just discussed right the point of they they need to see value if you are asking them to come to this in person youth meeting uh, they need to see why do i have to go there right uh, if if it's the same thing with for people wanting to attend church okay why do i need to go to the in person service uh why what will i get there in the in person service that i will not get online and so you make this different things you plan different uh, you know fun activities or what not um going to in person you actually get to see uh, each other you you know you you worship together just hearing one another it it's 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 wonderful isn't it so um like yeah you 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 design you you design um uh, certain certain activities programs that will attract um the youth yeah thanks for that question um they um uh, does anybody else have any you're welcome there any other questions and does anybody have anything that you want to ask or share there's very few of us so kiran aaron anything is there any challenge what you said is uh, drew buster last uh, can you believe hello i can hear you i can hear you yes can you hear me yes yeah. <laughs> yeah what you said is related to this two years people to people behave and the life uh, the practices have completely changed um sorry Thomas, your voice is breaking. Let's just say. The problem to get the people. Hey, uh, Thomas, sorry, your voice is breaking. We, we are not able to hear very clearly. Uh, um. okay um sorry thomas uh, i think something uh, there could be a connectivity issue sorry some issues in the mic okay so uh, just to very quickly uh yes thomas Hey, you want to try saying uh, speaking Thomas uh, no you okay Can you 
Can you hear me faster? Yes. Hello? Yes, sir. So what we are uh, discussing what you the last two years, uh, that's absolutely true. Every church has this challenge to get back the people. Because, um, in these two years, in, uh, in the Holy Communion also practice home itself through the life. So uh, the gathering importance, this generation forgot the gathering importance this, in these two years and uh, becomes comfort. Uh, I think we need more things. Sometimes we lose patience, but we need more patience and uh, to plan something to get back the people to church. That's the biggest challenge uh, today the yeah. ministers of God is facing. We spoke to some of the pastors and the, the church congregation hundred become like that. So this two years made such a big impact on church yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, we hope for things to get better, change. Uh, so, but yeah, I think uh, we we'll have to be patient and uh, you know just continue to seek God for His plans, His strategies, His uh, you know ask for His wisdom uh, that we need how to impact people's lives better. Okay, um, so these three points that we covered today, uh, I w I want to stop here and. Uh, I will continue with the rest of the course next week, but um, but yeah, I hope some of these points help and will help you um, plan your youth services a little better. Okay, there's um, so I'll stop the recording now. Uh, thank you all for joining, and uh, I'll see you once again next week.